protection and the health of rural underserved populations. For the goals for the Maine Lung Cancer Coalition, truly we're looking to engage and educate multiple stakeholders across the state of Maine, the general public, patients, healthcare providers, payers, policymakers, really looking at evidence-based lung cancer prevention and screening services. We're also looking to create innovative programs and strategies and then evaluate these strategies to increase access to evidence-based lung cancer prevention, screening, and treatment services to the entire state of Maine, including high-risk individuals in rural underserved communities. A special thank you to our funders that really have made this all possible, including the possibility of the Maine Lung Cancer Coalition. Our primary funder is the Bristol Miles Scrub Foundation, also the Maine Cancer Foundation, and the Maine Economic Improvement Fund. So our gratitude to our funders. This is just a quick snapshot of some of the partners that we have in the Maine Lung Cancer Coalition. As you can see, this is really, you know, across the state and truly how we feel that we can make this impact that we hope to make in truly making a difference in reducing lung cancer in the state of Maine. For the learning objectives today, we at the end of this webinar, that you'll be able to assess the magnitude, excuse me, assess the magnitude of the health risk associated with protracted exposure to radon. Describe the scientific evidence that supports lung cancer risk, risk estimates, and identify at least two resources to assist with patient education. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about radon in the state of Maine. Dr. Field and I felt that this would be just a nice introduction so you can keep these figures in the back of your head as he takes that deeper dive into radon. And so um, without further ado here, we'll continue with this. So in looking at the main state radon statistics, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, states that radon levels of four picocuries per liter of air or greater are called action radon levels that should be mitigated. The average indoor, oops, not sure why that's not coming up on your screen, it's coming up on mine. Hang on one second. Sorry, everyone. Hold on. Just having a little bit of technical difficulty here. Not sure why that's happening. Hang on, everyone. It's connecting me. This is from Zoom. Okay, if I would just hold on just for a second. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Sorry, everyone. For some reason, I was kicked out of the, the, the Zoom platform. So the average indoor radon level in Maine is 4.1 picky curies per liter of air. This equates roughly to one in three Maine homes that have a radon level above four picky curies per liter of air. As you can see, a pretty high number. Radon levels vary statewide. For example, the area around Sebago Lake tends to be higher in radon, resulting in almost one in every two homes with elevated radon levels. Radon can also enter a structure through water. The radon action level for water is 4,000 picocuries per liter of water. A large number of homes with drilled wells have radon levels higher than this action level, possibly 40% are higher than this action level. Due to dilution factors for a single family home, 10,000 picocuries per liter in water equates to an increase of one picocurie per liter in air in the home. Sometimes homes have to mitigate both air and water, but usually the best investment to reduce risk is to mitigate the air first, though both levels need to be evaluated to make this decision. And a thank you to Jay Hyland, he's the program manager for the Radiation Control Program for the Maine CDC, and he provided these statistics for me. And the plan in talking with him is that, you know, after Dr. Field really, um, you know, covers all the things that he needs to cover today, that we'll actually have another webinar taking a deeper dive into the main, the main landscape on radon. So now talking a little bit about state of Maine radon statistics, water specific. There is no federal MCL, which is the maximum contaminant level. The only time the state of Maine can require monitoring for radon is during new well approval for public water systems. 
The Maine CDC's maximum exposure guidelines, called MEGs, for drinking water list the radon MEG at 4,000 picocuries per liter. And this is applied to community public water systems, such as water utilities, mobile home parks, apartments. So really looking at the places where people live. This is a link, and you all have these documents. So this is a link to this information. And the level for acquired treatment at non-transient, non-community water systems, so schools, businesses, factories, or the places where people work, is during new well approval, and that's 20,000 picocuries per liter. This is just a snapshot from the, the US EPA website looking at Maine radon, local, the zones of local Maine radon, and I, I found this just fascinating. If you look at this, you can see all the counties, and you can see zone one and zone two are where we are for the state of Maine, and you can also see that the majority are zone one, which indicates counties with predicted average indoor radon screening levels greater than the four picocuries per liter over here. There's another nice visual for you. Again, just kind of taking that information I just showed you and putting it in a snapshot across the state. And again, you can see that unfortunately Maine is primarily red. So again, primarily looking at screening levels that are greater than the four um, picocuries per liter of air. And these again are higher than the levels determined by the EPA that should have mitigation. I just wanna now just quickly show you a couple of just uh, some uh, resources for you to learn more. We have a great, um, the Maine CDC Div Division of Environmental Health um, has a wonderful Maine Radon homepage. So this is just some, a few snapshots and screenshots to show you what that looks like. You have the link at the bottom. You click on, you can see in here there's a bunch of different test sheets and tip sheets, excuse me. And if you click on them, you can see this is just an example of one that comes up and they're really well written and um, are just a great source of information. On the tip sheet, for example, on tip two, tip sheet two, it does actually connect you to show how to get a main registered tester or a main lab for test kits if your home is not for sale. And it gives you the whole online database by going on and clicking on this link. So it's very user friendly. Again, this is another great tool. This is general information and links to lots of different resources. And then finally, one tool that is really great that I found is a radon frequently asked questions tool. So you just obviously click on that and there's a quick screenshot that shows you what that looks like. And that's actually four or five pages long and very informative. So again, just to give you some tools and resources to be able to go and learn some more. So that's that little snapshot we were talking about for the state of Maine. And today it is really my true pleasure to introduce Dr. Bill Field. He's a professor at the University of Iowa's College of Public Health with appointments in the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health and Department of Epidemiology. He's also the director of the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health funded occupational epidemiology training program at the university. Dr. Field is an international expert on the health effects of radon, and he has been actively involved in radon research for over 25 years. He was a lead author of the comprehensive Iowa Radon Lung Cancer Epidemiologic Study that has been actively involved in both the North American and global radon epidemiologic pooling efforts. Dr. Field serves as a member of the US EPA Science Advisory Board and chaired the Board Radiation Advisory Committee in 2014. He also served as the US Science Representative to the World Health Organization's International Radon Project as one of the three final reviewers for the CDC's Toxological Profile for Radon and on several National Academy of Sciences committees. He was appointed by President Obama in 2009 to the Advisory Board on Radon and Worker Health. So again, as you can see, we are truly um, fortunate to have him here with us today. And at this point, I will um, stop sharing and return control to Dr. Field. Dr. Field? All right, it's great to be with everyone today. It's, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the uh, uh, main uh, cancer folks for the kind invitation uh, today. And I'm going to have about 35 or 40 uh, minutes worth of presentations. I want to go pretty rapidly through a lot of the, lot of the slides, but I want them there uh, archived uh, for you to go back and look at it at a later time. But again, I, I really thank you for this invitation. Uh, as you heard, this is an area I've worked on for a good many years and quite passionate about. 
So what I want to talk about today, cover these general topics, radon occurrence, health risk, radon measurement, radon mitigation, and radon education for providers. Uh, we could spend a whole hour on each of these topics, uh, but I just wanted to give you an overview today of, of the uh, topic. And as you probably know, uh, radon comes from the breakdown of uranium-238, the breakdown of radium-226, and then the breakdown of radon. So radon's a gas. It moves easily into the home through the substructure. It's naturally occurring. Uh, and as you can see, I say here, it's naturally occurring outside. Uh, we used to say it was naturally occurring indoors, but during our work with the World Health Organization, we kind of build homes in a way that trap radon. So it's really enhanced indoors. So it's not just naturally occurring there. It's really an enhanced radiation based on how we build buildings. We build buildings that can trap radon. We don't have to build them that way, but we choose to do so. Uh, you can't see it or smell it. And it enters primarily from the soil, but in Maine, uh, Maine's one of the states that have higher waterborne radon concentrations. So in that state, uh, in your state, there can be a significant contribution from uh, radon, uh, spe specifically water sources that are well-based, or so groundwater. Uh, radon's really not a problem with surface water, it's at off gases. So as you can see here in the United States, um, the red, is the higher area concentrations, and as you've heard before, uh, Maine's right up there with a lot of the counties um, above the EP action level, as was, was discussed. Now we talked about radon can enter in uh, to the substructure of a building uh, through cracks in the foundation, um, uh, around pen pipe penetrations, uh, lots of areas. If you have a cinder block foundation, it's even more cracks for radon to enter. And then it can also enter through groundwater supplies, uh, through showering or dishwashing. Um, generally, if you, a lot of homes have their furnace in the, in the basement. So as that furnace is running and the house is closed up, it tends to you have forced air heat to push the radon up into the upper floors of a home. So when we talk about radon causing lung cancer, it's actually not the radon gas itself, and this is the radon decay chain. We start with radon 222, which is a four-day half-life, and it's a gas, but then it produces a series of decay products uh, with various half-lives, and the two that are really, a, that cause the majority of the lung cancers are polonium-218 and polonium-214. They decay by alpha decay and they're the ones that deliver most of the radiogenic dose to the lung. So radon gas itself doesn't cause that many lung cancers when breathed in, but when you breathe in the particles, that's where the uh, lung cancer, uh, that's the source of the lung cancer occurrence, these polonium-218 and polonium-214. And again, these are solid particles. So as, you, as you're in a home, the radon decay products form, uh, they can either get attached to particles or remain unattached, and depending what size particles they get attached to, you have various efficiencies for even these particles into your lung. Once they're in your, in your lung, these alpha particles don't go very far, but they deliver a lot of energy to your tissues. So one of the unique things um, about alpha particles that they, they cause a high number of double-strand DNA breaks, and as you probably know, Turn it off. I'm sorry for that. As you probably know, they cause a, uh, a lot of double strand breaks. Um, and then those are much harder to repair um, than single strand breaks. What you hope is that the cell dies uh, where, that, where that's occurring. It doesn't uh, then try to uh, rebind in an in a, uh, improper way that can initiate the cancer. So we talked about double strand DNA breaks. It also causes double strand or single strand DNA breaks. But one of the other things that radon does is forms uh, free radicals. So as, as these free radicals are formed, that can also cause um, uh, single strand double and double strand DNA breaks. It can also cause if the, if the tumor suppressor gene, P53 is hit, it can, it can damage that. So if you have an initiation of cancer, you won't have the suppression. And the study we formed a few years ago, people that are lacking GSTM1, um, which about 50% of us are, they have about a three-fold increased risk for radon-induced lung cancer. And what GSTM1 is, produces antioxidants oxidants that kind of counteract the counteract free radical formation. 
this is a typical long-term radon detector. And the reason I'm showing you this is I want you to look at this little piece of plastic that's inside the detector. So as radon enters through that filter, just the radon gas enters, and then it, it forms the uh, decay products, these decay products hit that little piece of plastic. And what you're seeing here are act actual um, damage caused by the alpha particle on, on the plastic. Oh, sorry, <laughs> now the phone's <laughs> going off. Uh, what you see is actual damage on the, on the piece of plastic. So each one of these is little alpha particle damage. You can imagine that these alpha particles that you breathe in can do this to a little piece of plastic, what it can do to your DNA. So it sort of gives you uh, some, some <laughs> observable um, input that you can see, wow, this, you know, these things do exist. Because one of the problems we have with the radon is invisible. You, know, you can't smell it. But looking at this, it shows you the impact it can make. And this is a blown up picture of that from a uh, laboratory. One of the things that, that uh, one of the uh, functions of the National Council of Radiation Protection is to calculate what our average dose is for the typical person in the United States. And this was a chart from back in 1987. And if you look at this point, a lot of our exposure was coming from radon. In fact, 55% was estimated to come from radon. And if you look here, medical x-ray about 11%, nuclear medicine, 4%. So try to keep these in mind as I go to the next slide. So they made up about, oh, 15%. So this was updated a few years ago. And now we can see, you remember the numbers before, now for the average individual, about 24% of our average dose is coming from CT, nuclear medicine, 12%, fluoroscopy, 7%, radiography, 5%. So it's really increased the amount of radiation we're getting from medical sources. And our radon exposure, we're having more radon exposure than we ever have. But just because these are so high now, the, uh, the contribution from radon has dropped to 37%. But if you, if you recall that radiation damage is cumulative, so with our increased use of all these um, medical procedures, any, anything, uh, any exposures we get from radon have a higher potential just because of the genomic instability caused by just um, all these different uh, sources of radiation combined. So when we first started looking at radon, um, there were a lot of studies done with animals. You would expose an animal, and the more you expose them, the more lung, lung tumors you saw in, in mice and rats, rabbits. Um, but they wanted to get some information on, on, on people that were exposed to, exposed to radon. So the National Academy of Science, uh, back in 1999, published a book, uh, Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, where they, they looked at the information that was, that was gathered from all these individual uh, the cohort studies of radon-exposed miners. And you can see they were performed, uh, the initial studies were performed all over the world. And they, they looked at this information, and uh, let me just say that some of these studies are still ongoing. We just have some recent uh, updates from, from several of these studies. So this was the original basis uh, for the 21,000 uh, lung cancer deaths that I'll talk about in a minute. But these were studies that were performed all over the world, uh, and we're talking thousands and thousands of workers and controls uh, contributed to this information. And you can see just looking at some of these studies, this is a China study, Czech study, Ontario. So what we have here is the relative risk. So when you see a relative risk of, of two, you're really seeing about 100% increased risk of lung cancer. And you can see the scale is different for some of them because the exposures of the various mines were, were very much different. But what you'll see for all of them as, as the radon uh, exposure increases, and this is in a unit called working level months, which is a cumulative measure of, of exposure to radon decay products. In all the studies, the risk goes, the risk increases. And here's some of the other studies. This red indicates what exposures you may see in a home at these EPs action level if you spend, spend your lifetime, seven, say 70 years or so, in the home. So you can see there's for some of these studies, there's a good bit of overlap with the cumulative exposure you may get in your home versus what's extrapolated uh, from the minor data. But you can see even here, there's increased risk, even at these, these concentrations that you see in your home from the minor data. 
radium hill study, the radium hill exposures are very similar to what you find in a home. So again, the red just uh, just shows you what you could expect at your home if you live there for a long term at 20 picocuries per liter. But as you can see, each of these studies, as the radon increased, cumulative radon, uh, the risk increased. So what they what they, uh, the uh, National Academy of Science did was they published this book, Risk Estimates Based Primarily on Radon-Exposed Miners. We had just started the case control studies at that time uh, that were performing in the various states around the, in the countries uh, in, the, in the world. And from this, the National Academy of Science estimated that there were around 18,600 lung cancer deaths each year from residential radon exposure. Later, a couple years later, the EPA updated this risk estimate, as you can see in 2003, and that's where the 21,000 that we use now uh, for our central estimate for what the attributable number of lung cancers are from radon uh, was first established. But if you look back, this was based on uh, information from 1995, so it's very much dated. The EPA right now is uh, re reassessing this number. Um, one thing that's good is smoking rates are down, and since there's a synergism between smoking and radon, that that would cause that could cause this number to decrease a bit. But since we had more people now exposed to radon than we ever had before, we we guess that this number is probably going to remain you know fairly stable as a risk estimate for the United States. One of the things that when we look at comparative risk. If we look at estimated new ca cancer cases in 2016, incident cases, obviously prostate for men and breast cancer for uh, women are the, is, is the highest, uh, highest prevalent uh, incident cases that we see. And, but if you look at estimated deaths, because uh, fortunately prostate and breast have better survival rates, lung cancer is the leading cause of death for both men and women. And if you look at these percents uh, for, for men and, and women, you can see the next highest cancer falls, you know, many percent after the uh, risk posed by, uh, by smoking and, and radon together. One of the things is if you compare, if you, let me just go back a minute, if you compare the 21,000 to the 158,000 or so from from lung cancer, it looks fairly small. It looks like a small contribution to the overall uh, lung cancer uh, occurrence. But if you look at radon, lung cancer attributable to radon, if it was treated as its own disease category, it would be about the ninth leading cause of cancer mortality overall in the United States. So it, it, it's hard, it doesn't compare to that when you're trying to message people. It said, well, you know, most are caused by smoking, and that's certainly true, and, and effort needs to continue to be made to reduce the smoking rates to the extent possible. But if you just look at radon uh, triple lung cancers, we're still talking you know, one of the top 10 causes of cancer mortality. And that's one of the reasons, oh, about four or five years ago, I started calling radon the leading environmental cause of cancer mortality. Uh, you can't say leading environmental cause of cancer because that would be sunlight, but I think it's safe to say that it's the leading environmental cause of cancer mortality, and I don't include ETS uh, in that, even though it's still more than what we think we're getting from ETS um, or or other sources. But it's a, you know it's 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 pretty amazing when you look at you know the contribution number of deaths from radon uh, compared to cancer mortality overall. It's fairly significant. So then there were concerns that, uh, that were expressed after the National Academy of Science published their um, Beer 6 report that the estimate of the 21,000 was based on extrapolations from the minor data. And as you know, and you can imagine, there's a lot of difference between a depositional environment for radon in a home versus the depositional environment in a mine. Uh, in a mine, mostly males, uh, in a mine, there's a lot more dust, potential for psoic exposure, the breathing's different, uh, the higher breathing rates, more oral breathing. So there's a real push to uh, perform case control studies. In the residential radon case control studies, they, they were performed in North America and Europe. And early on, we thought that that's to the extent possible, try to develop similar methods um, that eventually we can pull the data to give us, to give us increased power. Um, so 
you can see the different studies in North America that have been published and then the different studies in, in Europe and elsewhere. But you can see the number of cases and, and controls. And in these studies, the cases are people with lung cancer and the controls are, are matched uh, individuals age adjusted without lung cancer. Then you measure the radon concentration in the cases home measure the radon concentration in the controls home, that's how you come up with your risk estimates. One of the studies I was involved in was the residential, uh, residential radon gas exposure and lung cancer study performed in Iowa. Um, one of the problems with some of the case control studies is that you may have a radon concentration in a home, but if you don't spend much time there, it doesn't really matter what your concentration of radon is at home. So we tried to uh, make it a bit more rigorous. So we included information on where people spend time using a, a diary, uh, looking at life events for individuals that lived in the home. And when we increased um, what we, or we decreased what we thought was, was the exposure misclassification, the risk estimates increased. Now for the other risk estimates for the other studies, they weren't able to do this. They just looked at radon concentration in a home and didn't really look at mobility within that home. That was something we included. And if you look at this summary uh, slide, so odds ratio of one, one means no increased risk. And you can see the central estimate for the different case control studies, they're all to the right indicating increased risk. 1.5 odds ratio would be a 50% increased risk. Um, and the chances of having all these studies show a positive association in, is uh, pretty astronomically small uh, from a statistical viewpoint. But remember, these are just based on radon concentrations. When we look at the actual time spent in the home and get an estimate of actual exposure other than concentration, as in the Iowa study, uh, we see uh, increased uh, risk for that. There's a general tenet in epidemiology. As exposure misclassification increases, the ability to see an association of one exists sort of atten or goes toward the null. So it moves toward the null association. So it's pretty impressive to have all these different studies with positive findings given the, the potential exposure misclassification. That's non-systematic, non-biased, or, or non-differential bias. And there's the overall risk estimates for the pooled studies that were done in North America, China, and Europe. So overall, for the North American pooling, uh, we found over a 10% increase at three picocuries per liter. And just recall that the EPA's action level is four picocuries per liter. So we're finding a statistically significant increases even below the EPA's action level. And then the European study found about a 16% uh, increase in their pooled analysis. When I say pooled analysis, it's a bit different than meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is a summary estimate um, of the risk from different studies. So it will take one study that has maybe a 20% risk, another study has a 40% risk, and you may end up with a 30% risk if you don't weight them. What a pooled analysis does, it goes back and it takes all the individual data from all the studies and then does overall adjustments for everything. So it's a reanalysis of the individual data and not just summary estimates. We've been working on a global pooling. Um, we've been working on that for a lot of years, um, and I'm yeah, I'm hopeful that someday we'll be able to get that out. It's being led by Sarah Darby at Oxford. So based on um, these, these different studies, uh, the World Health Organization made a statement that the recent findings of the case control studies of lung cancer and exposure rate on homes completed may allow for substantial improvement in risk estimates and for further consolidation of knowledge by pulling data from these studies. And then the consistencies of these studies from the pooled analysis, case control studies uh, from North America, Europe, and China provide a strong argument for an international initiative to reduce indoor radon risk. And I really urge you, if you have the opportunity, uh, to go to the WHO site. Um, we developed a guidelines, so it was consensus guidelines from scientists in over 30 countries. And it really talks about, or lays out the evidence for the risk um, uh, posed by radon. There's information there on radon mitigation, radon testing, uh, uh, approaching, communicating radon. But I really urge you to, to take a look at that document. This is the World Health WHO Handbook on Indoor Radon. 
So one thing I wanted to mention a bit, you, you've heard uh, stated before that the EPA's action level is four picocuries per liter. And it's important to note that this is not a health-based guideline. Um, if, you, if you really look at it, the WHO guidance, their, their uh, level, it's not an action level, but it's a reference level is 2.7 picocuries per liter. In homes, the mean radon concentration is about 1.3, and outdoor concentrations are about 0.4. But if we actually treat a radon like the EPA treats other chemicals that they regulate, that they actually regulate, we would have to reduce the outdoor radon concentrations to below 0.4 to, uh, for us not to have over 100,000 chance of developing lung cancer. So if it was truly a health-based guideline, we'd have to get below this 0.4. So it's really a, a guideline based on what they thought was achievable. And in over 95% of the cases, uh, mitigation get the homes well below four picocuries per liter. And that speaks to the importance of radon resistant new construction that when homes are built, you can get them lower from the beginning. So you don't wanna just get them below four, you wanna get them as low as you, you possibly can. Here's some of the information that's been out there for many years, um, looking at the risk at the EPA's action level, and you can see it's fairly significant for smokers six and 100. Uh, people, seven in a, a thousand, uh, this is uh, per person from uh, lifetime risk of lung cancer. So in summary, just uh, this brief run through about the, the health effects, uh, residential has provided direct evidence now with the residential case control studies. We don't really have to rely on these, these extrapolations from the EPA coming up with the 21,000, but the risk estimates from the pooled radon studies and the extrapolations from the minor data uh, are in very good agreement, so they support each other. And radons are leading environmental cause of cancer mortality, and they say it's the ninth leading cause of cancer mortality overall. So let me briefly go into radon testing and mitigation, and uh, you'll likely hear a follow-up presentation for that, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this. Uh, generally, EPA recommends that homes be tested, say for a real estate transaction, under closed house conditions. Uh, the home is closed, is closed off, and uh, for a period before the testing is performed, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and then uh, if you have a mitigation system and you wanna, you wanna see if it's working, if that remains on. And you put a radon detector, they're short long-term. Uh, you put it up, up 20 inches away from a wall, away from a window. And for real estate transactions, you can do two simultaneous short-term tests and if the average of both are above a four, uh, then mitigation is recommended. If it's below four, no mitigation is recommended. But it's important to note these are the EPA's action levels or guidances, and that there's a lot of temporal variation with radon. Radio radon can have daily t uh, 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 changes uh, caused by uh, just use of HVAC systems, people opening and closing doors and really to get a good estimate of what your long-term exposure is would be a long-term test. But some, you don't have that uh, luxury very often when you're purchasing a home. So this is the method that the EPA came up with. In Europe, they really try to push longer-term testing more. Um, sometimes start with a short-term test. And if that's really high, you don't have to, you can, you can know that you have a problem. Um, but if it's like maybe two or three, you may want to do a longer-term test just to make sure. Homes uh, with high radon concentrations can be remediated. Uh, what is required is to drill a hole. Very often a mitigator will come in, they'll drill a little hole in the basement here to assess uh, whether or not there's communication under the slab and drill a little hole over here and put a suction to it over on this side and then generate smoke to see if smoke's pulled down through the, through the slab. And if it is, then one suction point's needed. But if you have a footer or something there, it may require uh, two uh, suction points. So those homes can be mitigated with one suction point. So these are run up through through the home, and very often the hard uh, the hardest part of the job is trying to figure out how to get it through a finished area of the home. In some cases, they're they'll run out maybe through a garage, through the side, and up through the garage, or uh, it or possibly even outside the home. The fan's always placed up here rather than down as it comes in because if you have a leak up in this area and the fan's down here, it's gonna be pushing the radon out into the home. 
generally, I, I don't know about Maine, but you know what we say for many times is that the cost is a thousand dollars at least, and generally, you know, it can be fourteen, fifteen, sixteen thousand or more, or, or sorry, fifteen or sixteen hundred or more to do that thousand. No one would ever test. <laughs> So here's where you see radon come up through these different penetrations. So you know, those are with radon resistant new construction, they're often sealed. But here's what it looks like with a four inch PVC coming up through the house, fans up in the up in the attic or above the above the uh, living area. And there's what it looks like when the fans uh, vented out through the roof. The best thing to do is put in radon resistant new construction. So these, even if you have a crawl space, these can be sealed with vinyl uh, suction put here. You have stone underneath with, with uh, good communication. And then you put a system in uh, when you're building the house. And very often the fans not put in it. And then when the homeowners move in, they can do a test. And then if there's a radon problem, you can put a fan in uh, the house at that time. So that's, that's much cheaper. It's much cheaper, it's cheaper, obviously, to put the pipes in uh, when you first build the house. So I want to talk a little bit uh, about radon, radon education. Uh, medical, a lot of people enter into educating the public about radon, but medical providers, uh, local health officials, but medical providers have an important role. Very often, uh, they're, the, they're the only folks or only scientists a lot of the people in public really deal with. They have a lot of trust. So healthcare providers play a really important role in radon education. Um, radon, our uh, EPA had a physician's guide many years ago, it was published in, in 1993, uh, but what we're working on now, we hope to have out by fall, um, writing it for the EPA, is a new guide for healthcare providers, it's called Reducing the Risk from Radon Information Interventions. And we've done a lot of focus groups with a lot of different providers uh, uh, creating this, this informational brochure. Um, one of the things we heard from selected focus groups is lung cancer among never smokers is rare. Um, if you look at that, if you look at lung cancer among never smokers, there's about an estimated 20,000 people die each year who have never smoked. So if you, if you really look how that, that uh, compares to all the other causes of cancer, if it was treated as its own cancer type, it'd be one of the top 10 causes of cancer mortality, lung cancer and people who have never smoked. And there's been recent studies suggesting that it may actually be increasing among uh, females, lung cancer in, in uh, females who have never smoked. So it's, it's not rare. Um, it's, it's a major cause of cancer in the United States, cancer mortality. Another found, thing we found from the focus group finding limited training about the risk posed by protracted radon exposure. Uh, when a lot of the physicians and healthcare providers went to school, it's not something that was in textbooks, uh, and we've been trying to trying to work on that. Uh, we published a few years ago uh, some papers in clinical uh, chest medicine. Um, just recently published just uh, a chapter in uh, Parks Occupational Lung Disorders that talks about all the lung carcinogens, but really focuses as well on radon. So we're trying to increase that. Uh, we're working, be writing an article this fall for American Association of Family Physicians and. Uh, for a pediatrician journals, so we're trying to get it in the uh, journals that are used by physicians, especially especially to highlight the upcoming um, new information guide on radon for healthcare providers. But this is a chapter we have in the in the new uh, parks. The other thing that we've been working on, we've been working on uh, developing a video for healthcare providers, and you can go to this website, and we have a 12-minute video, and then a longer version of video. We have Iowa-specific flyers that can be printed out, and we have national flyers that uh, can be used in any state and, and modified. But the video, um, both videos, really talk about this physician here at the University of Iowa that had never smoked and developed uh, lung cancer, which he attributed to radon, higher radon levels in his home. So he was a real advocate. But before I could work with him and and get him to assist with the video, you know with lung cancer, it's about a 50% uh, one year survival. He passed away. So we interviewed his family, and then we also talked to lung cancer survivors uh, and other healthcare providers. So if you have an opportunity, I really urge you, it's just a short video, um, but look at this video uh, that's really geared toward healthcare providers. We're working on CMEs that can be taken with some questionnaires with the new healthcare providers guide 
uh, for this fall. So that's something else we're working on. So if, if you can't find this link, if you go to the main EPA webpage, it also has, has this information listed. So you can find it from the EPA uh, right on webpage to a link to the video. The other thing we found from focus groups, uh, they have existing working relationships with cancer centers, coalitions, uh, and low-dose CT lung cancer screening centers. So we're trying uh, to, to really work with those organizations. Um, and one of the things as, as you have in, in Maine, the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program, one of the things is they really advocate creating coalitions. And you have such a coalition in, in Maine, I understand. And we've worked a lot uh, with the co these coalitions and developed not just a lung cancer coalition, but a radon coalition within, within the uh, cancer consortium at, the, at Iowa. And a lot of other states are working on that right now. And there are some funds available from EPA, or at least there, there were funds with, with the new administration. We're never sure of what funds may continue to be available, but there were funds used for environmental health tracking that you can access um, information that you collect that can go into a, a database. One of the nice things is, is you see everyone that QC is working with is all these co co consortiums, right now consortiums, are working with others. So when you start working with one, you really are tied into a, a really great network of people with a shared interest. The other uh, thing that we're trying to work on is after um, after the, the uh, a national lung cancer screening trial was performed. Uh, there, there was this really push uh, to get low dose CT screening for for individuals. So the the USP USP STF uh, uh, came up with the recommendations for low dose screening. And once these recommendations came up, one of the things they said that you may want to consider is is how much radon exposure someone's had too. So. I received a lot of phone calls uh, right after this came out as well, what's equivalent to pack years as far as uh, radon, radon exposure. So you can see here, you have 30 pack years smoking history and currently smoke 15 years then, um, and you haven't have not smoked for 15 years, uh, limits expectancy of willingness to have a curative lung cancer. So they re recommend annual screenings, but what we're not doing is we're not, as part of lung cancer screening for people that aren't eligible for this, we're not really reaching out to the lung cancer screening centers and having them provide information on radon testing, because that's something that can be done. And then the National cancer, uh, Comprehensive Cancer Network, they recommend 50 years of age and 20 pack years if there's been documented uh, high radon exposure. So that's, that's something we should, if you have an opportunity, talk to the folks on your low dose CT screening and see if you can uh, talk with them, because it really provides a teachable moment. People are concerned, and most of the people who get lung cancer now are, are probably uh, not current smokers, the people that smoked in the past. So here's our new guide. Uh, new guide's gonna have these various sections um, about radon. And then you can look back and, and check these out. And then we have a set for interventions that, that uh, healthcare providers can, can use uh, to talk to their patients. Uh, one, of the, one of the important ones is if possible when you're doing your interview, uh, to get that question, to have you test your home for radon, the simple question, and just have even on uh, a pre-printed prescription script the, where they can get radon uh, test kit. But uh, just including that with the smoking history and seatbelt use would, would really go a long way to getting people to test. So this is something that uh, is really helpful to do. Uh, as I said before, we're working on a CME for the video, and uh, that's that's all I have uh, at this point. Um, but I know I went through a lot of different uh, different information, and I urge you if you have any questions or if there's any other questions I can ask or provide any any assistance for anything that you're you're uh, communicating with your patients or other groups, you know, please get in touch with me. I, I like working with the different states. Uh, so now I want to want to turn it over. Thank you so much, Dr. Field. So appreciate this terrific webinar. So informative, rich in data, and um, you know, again, just a wealth of information. So thank you so much. 
So we do have some questions, so I will help facilitate that. So one of the first questions that we had was asking, are granite workers at risk? Um, can you un unmute your microphone, Dr. Field? Right. Okay, it's better? <laughs> yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. So as, as I was saying with the, uh, with the minor studies, anyone that's working with uh, uh, these materials that are, that are maybe higher in, higher in uh, radium has the potential. Uh, above ground uh, mining is not quite the problem, but there's still increased risk. But anyone that's working underground certainly has risk. Now there's been some current concerns about granite, not as you know from the from the perspective of miners, but granite from granite countertops, and there were some early scares about that. But that is that is certainly not something that I'd be concerned about. If you do a radon test and and you've checked out uh, sources coming into the home and checked out water supplies, that would be the last thing I worry about is any granite countertops or granite uh, materials in your home. Great, thank you so much. Another question is, are there public funds available for radiation as they are, say, for weatherization of a home for heat savings? No, but one of the, not that I know, but, but, but there are different localities, different uh, counties that do have some funds available. But one of the things that, that is helpful is that uh, radon mitigation is included as an expense under your healthcare fen, uh, spending account, federal healthcare spending accounts. So that and lead paint removal would be a would be a place to get some relief from the cost of mitigation. That's excellent. I didn't know that, so that's good to know. Good. So um, another question we have is: um, Does remediation prevent damage to individuals who are newly exposed, as well as the consistent occupants of a house with radon contamination? In other words, once someone is overexposed to radon, is the damage done? For instance, this, this um, question said as a melanoma where the physician would tell this person that the sunburn that they got at age 18 is the root cause of melanoma. So limiting the sun exposure today at say age 50 doesn't necessarily reduce that risk of developing melanoma. Right, and I think it does, like I mentioned with other forms of radiation exposure, after you get radiation exposure, you are at increase, you increase risk. But just stopping the additional risk greatly reduces your potential for future lung cancers. It's, it's not like it is for smoking that if you stop, you have a much greater risk of not getting lung cancer, uh, but many times the, the damage is done. And the best thing I think you can just say is don't start, don't start smoking and reduce former uh, future radon exposure. Um, but I'm also a big believer. I grew up in a house that had 30 picocuries per liter. I'm just trying to reduce my exposure, exposure now, not smoke, not be around ETS. But there's really not too much you can do after you get exposed, but I really think a lot of times people can bring stress on themselves by worrying about things they don't have control over. So if it's happened in the past, you had a high exposure, the best thing you can do is put that sort of behind but try to then limit uh, future exposures. Great, thank you. Another question, is there evidence that helps us decide on whether home radiation detection should be repeated at certain intervals or can one rely on the first legitimate test either after house construction completely finished or when one first moves into the used house? Thank you. Right, right. At, at minimum, I would say test every two to five years. Um, and if it was high to begin with, definitely every two years. Uh, it, I, a lot of it has to do with the short-term test. There can be so much variability. Um, so unless that test was, was very low up front, but I would really recommend testing it. Like my house has been mitigated for, for 20 years. <clears throat> excuse me, and I try to test it at least every two years, even though it's been mitigated. Uh, very, much, all, very often on the, on the mitigation that's been done, there's a little gauge there that you can see if there's suction, but you could have something blocking that, blocking that uh, mitigation system, and you can still see that there's suction, but it may not be working. So generally, when you have a house mitigated, there's been studies done in the past that 95% of the time, it stays mitigated. You know, the problem, but I've seen rare occasions where there have been changes in the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning that require uh, some additional uh, mitigation. Great, thank you. Are the reusable test devices as good as the one-time use devices? That's very controversial right now. So there's a lot of electronic ones out on the market uh, that, are, that are available right now, some from $100 or maybe a bit more. Um, they're not, 
generally not approved by the EPA since they can't be they can't be uh, calibrated or sent in frequently. Um, that said, the ones I've seen in in most cases they seem to work, but it may be something that you'd want to use uh, to do the regular testing that that are certified by the various agencies that certify detectors now. Um, but have something like that just sort of as, as sort of something you can look at that maybe give you some assurance that it's probably okay. But even if I had that electronic detector, I would still perform testing every two years. Great, thank you. What's the cost of a radon test kit? That could vary by uh, some counties have them for $10, $10 $15. Uh, some of the different providers uh, sell them over the web for 15 to 20 hours. So short-term test kits are generally 15 to 20. Uh, you may go into a, like a hardware store uh, or a big uh, discount store, and you may see them there for 20 or so. Make sure that that price of, of uh, uh, that you're paying also includes the lab fee for analysis. They usually do. Um, so they they generally are in that ballpark. So I would check with uh, with uh, health agencies, and maybe that's something that we can post along with the slides afterwards to give people a place where they can call and get reasonably priced uh, test kits. Uh, longer term test kits are a bit more expensive. They may run 30 hours or so. Great, thank you. Another question we have is, does radon cause other cancers than lung? There's more and more studies coming out where people are suggesting associations with uh, melanoma, basal cell cancer, uh, different types of leukemia, but there's nothing that's, that's, that's really been uh, verified you know, when you, when you work in epidemiology, there's a lot of criteria for causality. One of the criteria is that a lot of the studies that are done show the same result and the same magnitude of risk repeatedly over and over. You see it both for men and women. And so far, there hasn't been a study done that, that really gives you good confidence that we can say there is another risk associated with it. There was a large study done uh, with the American Cancer Society cohort that suggested that there's an association with radon and COPD. Um, but a problem with a lot of these studies is they don't have individual radon measurements for a person. They're based on a county. So you don't know if those county associations would hold for the individual. So I would say right now there's, there's more evidence starting to accumulate, but right now these are just hypotheses and they, they really need to be tested. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I think we have time for one more question. So that's perfect. So is there, the last question we have is, is there elevated risk for any other respiratory system or other cancers associated with radon? And you did just come Right, up. so yeah, so COPD is the interesting one. And I mentioned leukemia and maybe some, maybe skin cancer. Uh, but you think about these alpha particles, they're, they don't go very far, but where they, where they go, they can really cause damage. So you, and radon's lipophilic, so you think about bone marrow. So I think it's some, something that we, we hope to investigate in the future, but, but right now there are no studies similar to the, the case control studies that we perform that are going on in the world as far as I know. Great. Actually, I think we have time for one more. So if we could, okay. um, if you had to prioritize water over air radon, which would it be? Air, air. air. And even, even for Maine, I think the first step to do in Maine is do a test because if you're not getting elevated radon concentrations, you're taking care of both sources. So in in Maine, if it was if it was high, then I would do uh, make sure you do a repeat test to make sure it was real, and then maybe have uh, a contractor come out and uh, give you an estimate for repair, and then at that point it may be worthwhile considering. But remember that uh, water testing is is not that expensive but it takes about 10,000 picocuries per liter in water to contribute one in air. So in most cases, it's coming from the ground and not the air. And it's, it's kind of interesting if you look at what Maine has had sort of as a guideline of 4,000 picocuries per liter, that will, that, will, that will be similar to getting 0.4 picocuries in your air, and 0.4 is what you get from outdoor exposure. So I imagine that they considered that when they came up with that guideline. Great. Terrific. So if there's any other questions, we would just ask that you email them to Lizzie White, the email that we showed you at the beginning, and then she will be happy to put together um, some questions and answers, and we'll be in touch with Dr. Field for any of those questions that we're not able to, uh, to answer. So at this point, I'm just going to share my screen as we wrap up. So 
again, I uh, want to thank you so much, Dr. Field, for joining us. It's truly pleasure. a pleasure. And um, it's been great working with you, preparing for this webinar, and just, again, sharing all this wonderful information. So, again, appreciate your time and, and expertise today. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. So today, just in closing, the Main Lung Cancer Coalition, this is part of a webinar series. Again, I mentioned we had one last month that really went over the structure of the Main Lung Cancer Coalition. Again, we had this, um, again, the pleasure of having Dr. Field here with us today talking about radon and truly why it is a leading environmental cause of cancer mortality in the United States. And I think that case was made very clear today. So again, this is some future topics to just let you know there's more to come. Certainly, we're open to ideas and suggestions. So feel free to you know, send an email, go to the website, the Main Lung Cancer, mainlandcancercoalition.org. I do want to let you know about our next Lunch and Learn, which is uh, Tuesday, July 18th, and it's talking about the opioid prescription regulations and updates on Chapter 48 and related rules. And our guest speakers will be Gordon Smith, Dr. Gordon Smith, and um, Stephanie Nichols on that. And this is the link to go on to register. So in closing, again, on behalf of the Maine Lung Cancer Coalition, Maine Quality Counts, again, thanking Dr. Bill Phil for joining us today and thanking all of you for taking the time to join us. We hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. And again, you'll be getting an email tomorrow uh, with a link for CMEs and a survey for your feedback as well. So again, thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you.